the only way to achieve longevity is through healing. So we could have easily called this radical healing as well. And what the, the new discoveries are showing is that every organ in the human body has the ability to stop the deterioration, to heal the deterioration, the damage that's already occurred, and to regenerate uh, the tissue or the bone uh, or the, the, the gland uh, if it's given the right environment. And this applies even to, to things that we were told could not. So uh, spinal cord tissue, pancreatic tissue, brain tissue, heart tissue. We are the only form of life, Brent, and this is the key. We are the only form of life that we know of today that have the ability to self-regulate our own biology to achieve this kind of healing, this kind of longevity, and, and many other things. We simply are not taught about, uh, about this highly sophisticated, technologically advanced technology, our inner technology, our soft technology. We're not wires and chips. We are tissues, we are membranes, we are ionic potentials across cell membranes, and we self-regulate through the choices that we make in our lives, thought, feeling, emotion, belief, nutrition, movement, uh, environment, external environment, as well as the internal environment. No other form of life can do what we do. And this, this is really interesting for me because there is a new philosophy that is emerging in the scientific community. So let, let me just state the philosophy and then we'll flesh it out a little bit. The philosophy suggests that consciousness informs itself through its creations. So in other words, what we build in our world that we think maybe is entertainment or that we call diversions, books, music, <clears throat> sculpture, art, plays, movies in Hollywood, what we think are diversions are actually us informing ourselves of something about ourselves that we need to remember. And this applies to technology. And this is where it gets really interesting because if you look closely, and I, some of your, uh, uh, some of our, our viewers, our listeners, they may know that I, I come from a world of, of high tech. Uh, I am a degree geologist. Um, I have a very strong background in life sciences, so molecular biology, invertebrate, invertebrate paleontology, uh, but math, uh, physics, computer science, and I was a senior software developer uh, during the Cold War years in defense systems. So I, and I say that because I've had the opportunity. To, to be very, uh, have a very intimate experience with technology. And what I will say is it, as, as advanced as our technology appears to be today, from lasers to radar to communication to uh, storage technology and all those things, I have yet to see anything that we have built outside of our bodies that does not directly mimic a function that we already have, that we already uh, experience in the cells of our bodies. Every human has, uh, they say average, whatever an average human is, approximately 50 or so trillion cells in the body. Every one of those cells is about uh, 0 0.07 volts of electrical potential. Now, if we can harness that potential, uh, bring coherence to those cells, we can direct that potential to our healing, uh, as well as, as other things. Every cell in our body is a capacitor, it's a resistor. It transmits, it receives, it absorbs photons, it releases photons, it stores information, it releases information, allows us to access information, and that's what our machines are doing. So from this perspective, the complex technological world we're building around us, uh, as cool as it is, is reminding us of the the soft technology that we already embody. And the philosophy says, suggests that as we embrace the deep truths of our own existence, that we will begin to embody the fullest extent of what it means to be human. We, we may not even know just how powerful a human is. But what I can say to you is this, that we have this ability to self-regulate. And I know our our listeners, our viewers are familiar with the, the term neuroplasticity, the ability to change the way neurons wire and fire. Well, that concept now goes beyond just neurons. Bioplasticity, the ability to literally, literally 
self-regulate and change our biology. It goes beyond that, even to the DNA, to, to what is called genetic plasticity, the ability to upregulate and downregulate genes. When we begin to understand breath, focus, uh, and what are called epigenetic factors. So external factors of, of environment, nutrition, movement, exercise, all those things, internal factors, thought, feeling, emotion, belief, compassion is a big part of that. Interestingly, our most ancient and cherished spiritual and indigenous traditions, while they did not have the science, appeared to understand many of these principles. And so as an adult, my, much of my adult life, I've spent with these indigenous people to understand what do they know that we've forgotten or what do they know that we're only beginning to understand and how does the, the new science parallel what it is that our indigenous ancestors have preserved and that tells us what works and what doesn't. The things that work, let's do a lot of it. Let's, let's get as healthy as possible and longevity is part of that. Let's create the healthiest families, the healthiest societies, the healthiest relationships with other people and even between nations. And the things that don't work, let's stop putting our energy into them and, and stop doing the things that don't work. So for me, this is, it's kind of, uh, there, there are two facets to my work. One is the understanding of what our potential is. And secondly is, let's see what it means to develop that potential to its fullest extent. Uh, interestingly, a lot of the techniques that, uh, as I began teaching them in our live events, I'm now discovering that our intelligence services, uh, NSA, uh, and if you ever watch Jason Bourne, I'm a big Jason Bourne fan, well, the stuff that he's doing, a lot of that came from actual techniques that are being used in the intelligence agencies based upon optimizing human potential for super memory super recall, super cognition, uh, the ability to self-regulate in the presence of threats and challenge and danger. No other form of life can do this on demand, consciously on demand. So I think this is a, the next new frontier uh, of, of human evolution. Uh, and it's not the evolution in terms of changing the form of our body, it's yeah, so it's, it's based on a discovery that was made early in the 20th body century is always by a linguist. His name was Benjamin Lee Whorf. And I mean, this is, you can't make this stuff up. This is how the universe works. He was asked to substitute teach for a friend who was going on sabbatical at Yale University for a, a course in Native American linguistics. So the language, the words. And he chose to study the Hopi language. Well, what he began to understand is that in the Hopi language, there are no words to describe the past, no words to describe the future. Everything is present. Everything is alive. Everything is now. So that means if, if we were all standing beside the ocean and we were looking at waves, the Hopi won't say, hey, look at that wave because that makes it a noun. To them, that wave is present. It's happening now. It's alive. It is waving. So they would, they would talk about the waving, which sounds very different for us. Well, here's where, where this is important. That was in, in the 1937-38, right around in there. As the biology developed, what was discovered was the words we use, Brent, the words that we use determine not only how we think, but the words that we use determine what we're even capable of thinking about. What what we are even capable of conceiving is bound by the language that we use and our words sometimes they're they're vocalized often they're not scientists suggest uh, that we we speak to ourselves in words uh, about 60 to 80 thousand times per day in our mind so we think in words we speak in words and the words and the phrases literally uh, determine how the neurons in the, in the brain, and now we know in the heart, how they wire together to, to allow us these concepts. Well, this is where it gets very interesting. The Hopi, as, as we know, many native, and it's, this isn't limited, by the way, only to Hopi. That was just the first language. But many native traditions, they see a deep connection between themselves and the earth. They say, we are, are one, we are part of the earth. We're not separate from the earth. We're not separate from one another. 
we are all part of the web of life, is the way Chief Seattle uh, stated this uh, in the 20th century. And now they are attributing this worldview, this mindset, to the language that is actually being used. So with that idea in mind, I described that uh, simply in, in the first part of the new book. And what I know from my experience with ancient texts, uh, ancient cultures, indigenous traditions, is that we have always, as a culture, as a society, global society, we've always had words and phrases that we have turned to in times of need to help us deal with whatever it is that life brings to our doorstep. So I have gone into these ancient and indigenous cultures and collected and categorized those words that are sometimes prayers, sometimes mantras, uh, they are sometimes chants, sometimes single words, sometimes brief phrases, sometimes they are parables. What have we used collectively as a global family? What have we used in the past uh, to help us in, in difficult times? And I've categorized them in the categories like fear, categories like loss, uh, categories like, uh, like love. Uh, whether they're from the Upanishads of the ancient Vedas or the Buddhist texts, uh, or other Hindu texts, or the Christian texts, or the ancient Essenes. Uh, I've drawn on, on multiple and disparate traditions to bring and categorize the words that have changed the way we think about our problems and our challenges uh, to help us to get through what life brings to our doorstep. So in a nutshell, that's what this little, little small, uh, just very small format reference book, but that's what it's all about. Well, so I, I have spent uh, a lot of time from the uh, early 1990s into the um, early 2000, late 2000s uh, in Tibet. I was taking groups into 12 monasteries and two, two nunneries up high up on the uh, Tibetan plateau. So we had a lot of intimate contact with directly with the monks and the and nuns. And one of the things that we discovered was that they do not track their age. So if you ask a Tibetan how old they are, the first thing they'll do is they'll giggle because they don't even think it's a serious question, like who cares? <laughs> and, and then if you say, no, you know, really, how old are you? And, and they know what year they were born. So they'll say, okay, well, you know, what year is this? So you tell them, okay, 2008. And they'll write like uh, on their hand, like they were doing a, a pencil on their hand. They'll say, okay, 2008, I was born. And they'll say, oh, look, I'm 120 years old. And, and they are, I've seen their papers. I've met 120, 122 year old monks and nuns. And people say, well, isn't that interesting? But if you're, now we have specialized neurons in our neocortex uh, that are called Cubelli neurons. Uh, informally, they're called mirror neurons. And those mirror neurons don't know the difference between having an experience and witnessing an experience. This is why you can lie on your couch on a Sunday afternoon, uh, watch a football or a soccer game, you're motionless but your heart's racing, you might be perspiring, your muscles are tense, but you're not even moving. And these are those specialized cells, they don't know the difference. The brain doesn't know the difference between having the experience and witnessing. So, so we say, oh, isn't that interesting, anecdotally, but think about the potential. What do we feed the, our mirror neurons? Because if they don't know the difference between witnessing and experiencing, the witnessing may be outside the body or the witnessing can be in our mind's eye. The witnessing can be in our imagination. The question is, how do we think of ourselves? Because the way we think of ourselves to those neurons, the neurons are, are taking that image that we hold of ourselves and they're saying, okay, we've, we now have to program the body to match whatever this image is, the brain to release the chemistry. So when we say every year we're a year older and we attach the significance that our society gives to that, uh, that that means a, a degradation, a, 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 you know, in, in some way, some kind of a, um, you're losing access to 
your fundamental abilities. The brain will, will match that. But in cultures, Tibet, for example, where they don't do that, if you look at these people, uh, I mean, they don't look like teenagers, but their eyes are clear, their memory is sharp. They don't have the cancers that we have, uh, breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer. They don't have Alzheimer's, you don't see Alzheimer's. I mean, 120, 122 years old, memory, sharp, you know, just really sharp. And so you have to say, what is it that we can learn from these people? And our science now is only catching up with this understanding. Now, our ancestors have used mirror neurons to teach students, um, yogis, ancient, Milarepa was a, an ancient yogi that I've studied for years, taught his students to move beyond the limitations of their beliefs by using their mirror neurons. He would demonstrate something that they thought was impossible. And when they saw it, then they had to make room for that in, in their belief system. So aging and longevity is just one example of where, uh, where I think language can play a very important part. Uh, and as we learn to adapt language that is more inclusive, our Western language is all based upon separation. You and me, them and us, here and there, uh, you know, before and after, and I believe that's reflected in the way we solve our problems and the way we think about our, our lives. So uh, it's one aspect of, of some of the new discoveries. Now they're, you know, they're changing everything about the way we see ourselves. So 